Well, I used to call myself Dimitri in the early days of my career. Started doing a lot of remixes and, you know, everything was remixed by Dimitri. I had this first international kind of artist to remix. Her name was Bjork. Uh, and I did this mix and um, I handed it over to a couple of guest DJs that went through Paris and that I had interviewed in my show, namely like Frankie Knuckles, David Morales. Six months later, uh, I get a call from a Japanese guy living in New York saying, uh, can you get me a copy of that mix that you did? I said, how do you know about this? Uh, well, because David and, and Frankie, they're just hammering it. They play like three times a night, every time they play. Like, oh, wow. So that was like great recognition for me. And I was really happy that, you know, that my name, Dimitri, would spread around. A few months later, Louis Vega comes and I interview him in my show. And uh, I'd figure he might like the record. So I offer it to him and he goes, where'd you get that? I've been looking for that everywhere. So how come you have it and I don't have it? Well, because I did it. So no, you didn't. It's uh, Dimitri from D-Light who did that. And I was like, what? <laughs> no, I did it. I mean, you know, check the credits. You know, he wasn't really believing me. Check the credits, says remix in France, blah, 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 by Dimitri. And he was, oh, damn, you know, he's claiming that he's done it, you know? So I was really mad because I, I started having my little bit of recognition out of France and, and this guy was stealing my name kind of thing. Since then, about like 93 or 94, I decided to become Dimitri from Paris. Yeah. Music that's emotional, music that has a strong emotional content. And for that reason, I like disco as one of the best forms of dance music because it has a lot of people involved. Uh, it has a lot of soul involved and actually actual souls uh, in every musician that plays because it's, it's all live. It, you have like a bass player, a, drum, a drummer, you have a guitar player, you have the singer, and every one of those persons is putting some soul into what he's doing and, and the, the content is, is quite emotional. And even if it's done today with a drum machine or whatever, it still needs for me to have that kind of strong emotional content that when you play it, it kind of reaches people in a different way than just a beat making the body shake. It also touches this, their, their mind. The first one came out about seven years ago. It's called Sacre Bleu. Uh, it was out on Yellow Productions, uh, the label of uh, Chris, aka Bob Sinclair. The second one has been released uh, quite recently in Japan and it's going to be released later on in the rest of the world, which is called Cruising Attitude. That's pretty much the follow up to Sacre Bleu, which uh, instead of using a lot of samples like the first one, is all acoustic uh, and features vocals by. Um, people like Omar or Victor Davis. It's um, kind of more of a laid back thing. It's definitely not a dance music album. And in between those things, I did a lot of compilations and uh, um, namely like the Playboy Mansion series, uh, A Night at the Playboy Mansion and After the Playboy Mansion, which was like the volume two. And um, also a disco, a couple of disco compilations, uh, Disco Forever, uh, which uh, features a lot of uh, kind of obscure and rare disco cuts that I really liked. And uh, My Salso, which is my selection of my favorite salsa recordings. So that's pretty much uh, roughly my discography in terms of albums. Well, I, I was really uh, pleased that um, Simon Dunmore asked me to, uh, to do a compilation for Defected because first of all, uh, I had a lot of respect for the label. For me, doing a compilation for Defected would, would give me the opportunity to showcase what I was doing as a DJ in a club. It wasn't gonna be a disco compilation, it was gonna be more of a house thing. But I could, you know, I could do a house compilation with, you know, showcasing my idea of what is house and what I play uh, as a DJ. So um, that my main goal was to pretty much, you know, uh, make create a mood onto two CDs that would, you know, basically give people the idea of what I am musically. When you do a compilation, it's uh, it's always difficult to to um, to make a track listing because uh, you can't always get what you want. A lot of 
uh, the companies, you, you, you have to approach every company and ask them, can I use this track, can I use this track, you have to ask the label, you have to ask the artist, and, uh, and sometimes they just say no because they don't want to be there. And uh, on this track, it seemed that everybody was really happy to participate, and, uh, and we got all of the tracks except for one because we couldn't actually find uh, the people who uh, the original producers of that track. So there was uh, only one track that we can use, and uh, it was pretty difficult to track down Lil Lewis. I used all my network connections to actually get his phone number and, and harass him over the phone uh, to, uh, to give us the track. And he, he was really good. He says, normally I wouldn't do that, but if it's for you, you're part of the family, so I'll do it. So I was really proud that uh, he considered me part of his uh, own little uh, family. And uh, eventually he let us use the track. For me, it was really important that we could use that Lil Lewis track as the opening as well. So I told him, you know, it's gonna be a statement, so you have to give it to us and say, no problem. When I do a mix CD, as opposed to when I mix in a club, uh, I have a different uh, idea in mind. When I'm in a club, the main goal is to make people dance, make them have a good time, and you're here for them. You're not here to, to I mean, you can educate them, but, but you're not here to bore them. They haven't paid like the door, the door price to go to school. They have paid to you know, have fun. So you have to keep that in mind and try to please them. Um, when you mix uh, something that's meant to be on a CD, I'm thinking more of a you know confined and intimate environment as opposed to this CD being playing on a dance floor because this is not exactly what I would do. I wouldn't mix the same way if it would be like if I had the same records, I wouldn't mix them the same way if I, if I had to play them on a club. It has to be able to stand the test of time, so you kind of just jam all the hits of the moment because you know after three months people are going to be bored. So you have to make a careful selection. Uh, something that people can listen to over and over, something that can be kind of timeless. Yeah, there's this uh, information about me that I have never been to a rave, which is true, so I can confirm that. Uh, I actually went once, uh, DJed once in a rave, but the main reason, first of all, is because I started DJing before the raves. I started DJing about 20 years ago, so the first raves only came about like 15 years ago or something. So that's one of the reasons. The other reason is that the music that I like, which is more musical, more has a lot of harmonies and not so much like beats and, and, and things that are energy based, wasn't the music that people telling me they were listening to, they were hearing at rave. So that was another element. I felt like the music wasn't the one I was gonna like. I think the key element is trying to get exposure and uh, you have to try everything you possibly can to get exposure, whether you send your tapes on the radio to the promoter, you have to never stop sending stuff around until you eventually get noticed and also try to make some music can help if, you, if you're into that. Well, right on cue though. <laughs> 